All right, welcome back to Pedagogy Non Grata, where we bridge the gap between the scientific uh, literature and teaching in the classroom. I'm joined here once again by Dr. Catherine Garforth, who's giving a real money or a real run for her money to uh, Alicia Smith for my most had on guest. Um, I actually got a request from a, a listener to the podcast on the, the topic of if you are a balanced literacy teacher who's been doing balanced literacy for the last 10, 20 years, and you want to make the switch over to a structured literacy approach, how do you go about doing that? How do you start? Um, so Dr. Garforth has come on to discuss that with me, um, and I'm going to let her do a little bit of an intro for herself and uh, the topic for today. Take it away, Dr. Catherine. Thank you. So I'm Dr. Catherine Garforth from Garforth Education, and I am trying my best to help teachers understand uh, how the brain works when it learns how to read. And I find a lot of teachers are in this position where their teacher training has taught them one thing and they're realizing and uh, they're seeing things on their Facebook feeds, on Twitter, on wherever they're looking that there's something more, there's something, maybe it's the science of reading, structured literacy, um, it has many terms, but they don't know how to get there and how to broaden their understanding. So what I think is the best way to start is to understand two of the founding theories that are really behind this movement. And the first one is the simple view of reading. And this was put out by Tumner and Goff in 1986. And it's a way of conceptualizing reading as a mathematical equation where you have word recognition multiplied by language comprehension. And that gives you fluent reading where you have a student who's able to comprehend what they're reading. Word recognition simply refers to the ability of the student to read the word. Language comprehension has to do with the ability to understand the language being used in the text. When we look at struggling readers, we see that they can have a problem with either side of this equation and even both. So if we were to fill uh, the numbers of one and zero into this equation, we get a better understanding of why a student might be struggling to read and understand what they're reading. So if there is a zero on the word recognition side, it doesn't matter if they can understand everything they hear orally and have great conversations with you, they're not gonna be able to understand what they're reading. On the other side of the coin, if they're really good at reading words, but they don't understand what they're reading, uh, they might be considered hyperlexic, it's, the problem that they still need to understand what's being said in order to take information from what they are reading. Now, in the real world, we're not gonna see values of zero and one. We're gonna see things like kids that are 75% proficient at their word recognition and 100% at their language comprehension. But because of the decimal, it's gonna make it smaller. So even though they could understand the passage, no problem if they heard it because their word recognition isn't at that 100% level, they're not gonna be able to understand everything that they're reading. If they're really good at understanding, or sorry, recognizing the words, but they have problems with understanding the language, then again, it's gonna impact their reading. So, that is the simple view of reading. And it's something that you'll uh, hopefully become familiar with if you aren't already. And understand that if we look to it, it can really help us understand our students' needs to identify where they need support. Now that's just the first step. The next thing that can provide a lot of insight into reading is Scarborough's Reading Rope. And I'm just about to share that with you. So in 2001, Hollis Scarborough created this reading rope and it goes into more detail 
than the simple view of reading and breaking down those two components further so that we understand the skills a student needs to have good word recognition and adequate language comprehension. And we see that having an a, a problem in any one of these areas is gonna have an impact on the goal, which is skilled reading. Word recognition has three components that need to work together in order for the students to be able to read a text. The first is phonological awareness, and that is the awareness of speech sounds within a spoken language. Phonological awareness goes even further into smaller elements, such as the number of syllables in a word or phonemes in a word. Phonemes are the individual speech sounds in a word, such as k or t or th. Those are things that our students are needing to identify when we're asking them to sound out words and when we're actually asking them to spell them as well. We want them to be able to decode words, which is asking them to blend individual phonemes together. So if they see a word like tree, t or e, they need to have the sound symbol correspondence to know that the letter T represents T, R represents R, and the E E is a digraph or a, a vowel pair that makes the E sound. So once they go T or E or T or E, blending them together to tree, there are several different cells that we can work on with the phonological awareness and the phonemic awareness that can help students become proficient so that the asking them to blend and segment words into their phonemes is an easier task. And this is something that we can start doing in those early childhood years and in the preschool years. Issues with phonological awareness are one of the hallmark signs of dyslexia and a lot of word reading issues come back to problems with phonological awareness. When we're talking about decoding, we're looking at whether the student has an understanding of the alphabetical principle. Do they recognize that the little squiggles on the page represent words and that they are letters that represent speech sounds? Can they identify the letter and the sound it's associated with in a fluent manner? Or do they have to stop and think about it? When they have to stop and think about it, it makes it more taxing on their working memory. So that space that they need to hold um, information in when they're trying to manipulate it and use it. So if they're sounding out a word that's multi-syllables and they're sounding it out letter by letter, it's going to be difficult because there's only so much storage. The ultimate goal is for students to have sight recognition of words. Now that doesn't mean that they've memorized them and they, they don't understand why it says that. They can tell you why it says it in a lot of the situations. It means that they have orthographically mapped the word so that they can recognize the word within a fraction of a section, sorry, of a second. As these three skills get better, we see the rope getting a tighter braid happening and we're wanting it to increase in automaticity. This is what we're focusing on in those first years of school. This is where the majority of our instruction is going to be happening because while the language comprehension is a very key element of literacy instruction, that's more of the focus in the intermediate years we're still working on language comprehension in our other subjects, but our literacy instruction doesn't have the same need for it at the beginning. We're already working on their background knowledge just in our everyday instruction and conversations with these students. The vocabulary is naturally expanding. In those early childhood and beginning school years, the number of words that a student is learning every day is exponential. 
language structures and semantics, we're teaching those more in our, uh, our writing lessons, teaching them about capitals and periods and the orders of the words. As students get older, we're putting more of a focus on the syntax and the semantics of the language. As students get older and are in the intermediate, middle and high school grades, that's when we're gonna be working more on the verbal reasoning and working on how they can take a deeper understanding of what they are reading. The same goes for literacy knowledge about genres and types of literacy. So these are twisted together into a tighter rope that becomes increasingly strategic and they're more aware of what they are covering. As the language comprehension and the word recognition begin to work together, that's when we see the student's ability to become that skilled reader that has the ability to comprehend what they're reading in a good amount of fluent and time matter. So I hope that gives you, you know, a quick overview of how a lot of the reading develops and what it's going to mean for your instruction, depending on where you're at and the students you're working with. Great. Thank you, Dr. Catherine. Um, I, I sort of like to look at it as some foundational knowledge um, versus uh, that sort of complex knowledge that we need to develop later on. You know, like personally, I really like to focus on this idea of phonemic awareness, uh, decoding, um, and morphology at the start, and then um, transitioning to fluency instruction, and then transitioning to comprehension and primarily writing instruction. Um, not that we shouldn't include a little, and I think this is one of the, the resisting pieces for people from that balanced literacy crowd. They hear this and they're saying, you, you mean never teach comprehension instruction in like the early grades? And I think it's not about never teaching it. It's about that, that priority that prioritization. Like, do you really want to spend a lot of time, you know, talking about comprehension strategies with a student who doesn't know their letters yet? I would argue, no, that doesn't make any sense. Um, well, realizing that comprehension instruction doesn't happen, have to happen in that language arts block and yeah. all the other activities that you're doing, you can work on language comprehension strategies that are gonna apply to reading comprehension, but they don't necessarily have to happen in that reading comprehension framework in those early years. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, okay, so let's start talking about practical takeaways. So how would you go about teaching uh, reading in a kindergarten or pre-K class? The first thing that I would do would be doing screening because children come into your classroom at the junior kindergarten and the kindergarten level with a wide range of skills and understanding about print. Um, there are a variety of different parenting strategies, some of them placing extreme emphasis on the written word, reading lots of books, having in-depth conversations with their child. Well, the other end of the extreme is you know, they're in front of a screen. And it may not be because that's what the parent wants, but it's what the parent needs to do given their situation. Yeah. So understanding where the child's language is at. Do they know their letters? Can they identify them? Do they recognize that letters represent sounds? Do they even have basic concepts about books? Do they know which way to hold them? Do they know which way to turn the pages? Do they realize what the words are? Taking a look at these skills does take a little bit of time. I'm not going to say that it's, you know, done in a second, but it doesn't take a lot of time. And the amount of time that you invest into that is going to pay off so much when it comes to working in your class with your students, because you're going to have a better understanding of the skills that they need to work on. And you're going to see more success in the long run because you're addressing their needs. If you have, you know, this group of students that really struggles with phonological awareness and phonemic awareness, there are a lot of fun activities and games that you can do with them that can help make that skill just that much better so that when you do move to the reading instruction and the letters and the sounds, they are that much 
better at understanding what actually an individual sound is and that our speech is made up of sounds and you can manipulate them. Mm -hmm. um, once we do that screening, it's not just do the screening, record it and forget about it. You wanna use that screening to actually inform your instruction. So you do create uh, those small groups in your classroom when you recognize that there are areas that certain students struggle in. Um, another thing to remember is that reading instruction and spelling and writing instruction go hand in hand. And it's better when we link them together early on. So having them learn how to actually do the letter formation. And I think that's one thing that we're missing in a lot of the classrooms is that focus on the printing instruction and having it structured, making sure that the students know that letters go top, down, left, right, and that they can recognize the difference between a lowercase and a capital letter and realize the association between them. What does a capital letter A look like and what does a lowercase letter A look like? And even though they look different, they represent the same sound. Um, another thing that I'd like to mention at this stage is you are going to see issues with reversals of P, D, Q, and B. But at this point, technically speaking, it is developmentally appropriate for them. And that's because they're thinking of a letter as an object and not as a symbol. I find once they get this explanation to them explicitly saying, look, I know that if this were a pen, no matter which way you looked at it, it would still be a pen. But this is a letter and it's a symbol to represent something. And you need to understand that orientation or the position that it's in does matter. Now, this is something that some kids take longer to develop than others. And it doesn't mean that they have a specific learning disorder in reading or writing because the reversals take place in these you know, pre-K and K levels. Um, you also wanna include the explicit phonics instruction, right? And the phonological and phonemic awareness. So work on things where you're breaking words into their individual phonemes or identifying words that begin with the same initial sound, the onset. These are all activities that are completely appropriate for kids at these age is. One thing that I do wanna highlight is things like rhyming. While it's an important phonological awareness skill, it's not essential for reading instruction. So even though it is good for children to develop, some don't develop it until they begin reading instruction. And just because a student can't identify those rhymes doesn't mean that they're not gonna be able to read. The thing about phonological awareness and phonemic awareness is it's a man-made construct. If you look at an audio recording of sound, you're not gonna see the individual segment, segments between the phonemes. So, once they begin to have that reading instruction and the phonics instruction, sometimes that's what it takes to click and understand that, oh, okay, so I get what they're doing. I know in my experience when I've done testing with children, I can, and I'm doing tasks that measure phonological awareness and phonemic awareness, I can actually see them spelling the words in their brain and picturing it in their head to figure out how to break it up. Some children need that. I really like your your focus there on the emphasis of assessment. Um, I, I've been spending a lot more time on social media lately discussing this, and I frequently see the question of I have a student who is low comprehending. What do I do? Or I have a student with low fluency. What do I do? And I'm always like, that's nowhere near enough information. Like we need assessment data. Here's what you need to go back and look for. Like Exactly, because there's so many reasons yeah. that can be contributing it, to it. And especially when you see students in the older grades yeah. and you're like, oh yeah, well, they can't comprehend. I'm like, well, can we read the words? 
Like, where is the root of the problem? Because if we're not addressing the root of the problem, yeah. then we're not going to see the progress that we're expecting. And putting a child in an intervention that's not appropriate for their deficits can be very, very traumatizing for the child because they have all these promises that, oh yeah, you just need to do this and it's going to be all better and fixed. Well, you can't make that promise unless you understand what the problem really is. And especially in cases where it comes to fluency, some children need multiple exposures to the same word to do that orthographic mapping that I was talking about. So they can have that instantaneous recognition of the word within a fraction of a second. And if they're going to need to read a word, you know, 150, 500 times, your, your intervention that's focused on fluency isn't going to be able to provide that to them in that short period. Yeah, I, I, I 100% agree with that. Um, and I, I think one of the things I see that's a trap, and I don't want to spend as much time on this, but one of the things I see as traps, people just relying on other people's assessments, especially when those assessments are too vague. Like I frequently hear it, what teacher being telling me, well, the student was assessed by the spec ed teacher as having low comprehension skills, and I was told that's what I should focus on. But uh, we need to know exactly why they're having comprehension problems. Do they know their sounds? Do they have phonemic awareness? Are they decoding? Are they decoding really slow so that it's ending up um, taking more time than they can process the information? Um, do they need more practice time on fluency development? Like to me, comprehension is sort of that last step to focus on. And it's it kind of rare that it would be the issue. I'm not saying it's never the issue, but it's probably would be my last thing to check personally. Yeah, you, you need to start at the, the foundation, right? And see if they yeah. have the skills. And the other thing that I, I didn't mention about the phonics instruction at this level, we don't start with A, the first week of school and through 26 weeks get to Z. Yeah, because, that's really the point. Uh, that's not gonna help kids because after six weeks, they're only gonna be able to read a handful of letters based on using their phonics skills, based on sounding the words out with the letter sound correspondences that they've been explicitly taught, that you've directly taught them. Yeah. You wanna make sure that you choose the scope and sequence. So the number of letters and the order in which you're teaching them very carefully, because you know A to F, there's not a lot of words that you're gonna come up with there. But if, you know, a common scope and sequence starts out with the letters S-A-T-P-I-N, and with just those six letters, you have, I believe it's over 40 two and three letter words that the students are going to be able to sound out, recognize, and understand within just those first six letters. The other thing is we want to teach different ways of representing vowel sounds and letting the students know, look, there are 44 different phonemes in the English language, give or take, depending on where you leave, live and the accents that you're working with. Um, but there are only 26 letters in the English alphabet. So some of these letters are going to have to do double duty. And there are some cases where we need more than one letter to represent a sound. So that's when we need to make sure that we're explicitly teaching those digraphs and trigraphs or two and three letter combinations that represent one phoneme fairly early on. For example, the letters TH representing the sound or M mm, is one that they're gonna see a lot. Think of it, that. How many times do you see a kid that has to read the word that in their, you know, first few books? That's a really common word and understanding that TH represents it or the sound is huge. I think it's very important for teachers to look at the, the, the phonics or the grapheme phoneme correspondence and recognize those sounds and learn the difference between a voiced and a voiceless sound because it's gonna help you out a lot in your own understanding of our spelling system 
and also when you go to try and understand what's happening for your student, especially when it comes to spelling errors, because there's something called minimal pairs. And minimal pairs are phonemes that say have the same articulatory gestures. So your mouth is in the same shape, but the only difference is the amount of air that you're forcing through your air box. So if you're forcing air, it's considered voice. So mm, or g, right? But it's voiceless if you're not having that same voice. So or k, right? One way that you can tell the difference is by putting your hand over your Adam's apple and you'll feel more pressure. So when you see spelling errors, ask yourself, oh, like I don't have a clue what this is saying. Maybe if I try it to substitute it with its minimal pair, maybe I'll see that. Because especially when we're working with uh, English language learners or English as an additional language learners, their first language, or their home language may not have the same phonemes as English. And we see this a lot with the Chinese languages. So to them, the O and the er sound are interchangeable. So you'll see individuals who have a Chinese first language and have not gained that awareness in English of the difference between the two struggle in those areas. Yeah, I really, I really like your point of not doing the one letter per week thing. I, I've seen that quite a few times. I, I also just think like it's too slow of a pace. It's way too slow of a pace. Students are definitely capable of learning letters faster than one a week. Um, and I was just sort of thinking of like practical things that teachers can do. You know, I'm thinking of like the phonemic awareness one. One that I saw like had the best um, results in the um nrp analysis was just the blending just practicing blending so like say a word out loud to the students and have them segment out the pieces of words so what sounds do you hear class apple do you hear the a p l sound um or trying to get a fun one i saw about having them do that's pretty proven in meta-analysis is having them try and remove sounds or reverse sounds um and that's that's sort of a step before you teach them the letters and then i think like teaching them the letter sounds personally i love flashcards um i love games and i think the question that i, I got from some kindergarten teachers is like well we've been doing centers we've been doing play-based learning kids are way too young at that age to do explicit instruction i don't think that's true and i i think it's also like it's it's about the timing of it no you're not going to sit the kids at a desk and have them do six hours of phonics instruction but you might have 10 minutes in the morning where you do a phonemic awareness lesson and then work with students uh, in small groups throughout the day as they're playing, uh, other students are playing and do some explicit instruction of phonic sounds. Uh, what are your thoughts, Dr. Catherine? I think that's a very good point. And even at circle time, right? Practicing blending and segmenting their name, uh, depending on the name, some may be more difficult than others or you know, let's go to the d or er, right? You know, just play with it in the class um, as you go along. And I want everybody to s t a n d a. Uh. I love that. That's a great idea. So just it's not like it explicitly in a lesson. Yeah. And yes, there are going to be some kids like, don't do this the very first day, <laughs> right? do it with the easier CVC words at the beginning. But as your class gets better at it, then you want to put it in. And yes, there are going to be some kids that struggle with it and need that additional support, but they're going to get it from their peers, right? So if they can't realize that st, a, n, d is stand, but they see everybody else in the classroom standing up, they'll figure it out. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, oh, sorry. So I was just going to say one thing that I remember hearing in my teacher education program that always stands out to me in those primary years, there is going to be at least a few students in your class at any one time that has an ear infection. Hmm. And this is going to affect their ability to hear sounds. So that's something that you want to be cognizant of 
and the fact that if you notice those speech problems that they don't really speak super clearly, that is indicative of a phonological processing issue. That's when you want to get the support. You can get your, your spec ed teacher or talk to the SLP, speech and language pathologist, to see if they can get their support. Most schools have a hearing screen at this age. There are so many kids in those preschool and kindergarten years that end up having to get their ears tubes because there's actually a blockage in their ear that needs to be drained. And that's going to impact. It's like having, you know, your ears plugged with water after swimming. So you're not, or when you're sick, you're not hearing things clearly. Yeah, I, I think those are great points. And I, I would just love to reinforce to the, to the audience, you know, like, this doesn't have to be an all day thing, but we do need, we definitely need some explicit instruction and time in a day. I think it's your circle time. I think it's that start of the day. I think, and it's working with small groups while your kids are having that play-based learning time, taking a group of kids, spending 10, 15 minutes with them, doing a little bit of phonics practice or a little bit of phonemic awareness practice, I think is really important. And there's going to be the kids that come into your class that they can do this. No problem. I mean, uh, I've got three children. My first two struggled with it. My youngest, she's been doing it no problem. <laughs> and so you're going to have those kids that come into your class having no problem with this. We'll teach them Pig Latin. Yeah. yeah, they're going to have fun learning Pig Latin. You know, it's not something that they have to learn how to do, but they'll have fun. Do you want to explain? Because I don't think the average listener is going to know what that means or what that's for. Do you want to explain the benefit of that to the, the audience? So it's getting the student to be able to take the initial phoneme so like my name would be atherin k right and you would be eight nay so you take the initial the co first consonant sound from the beginning and you put at the end of the word and add an a to it um and some people are really good at it who have an ear for languages or an ear for phonological awareness. Personally, I am dyslexic and I do have phonological processing issues. So it takes me a little bit to stop and think about it. Um, but the more you do it and, you know, it's also playing those silly songs, mm -hmm. right? Um, will it be wildly woo? Or if it's someone's birthday, when you're singing happy birthday, instead of saying happy birthday to you, if uh, the student's name is Ben, Happy birthday, boo, boo, right? Just change it. Yeah. And those things are fun. It's not explicit instruction, but the kids get a laugh and they enjoy it. They like being silly, yeah. right? I remember, you know, talking about getting a little robot and saying it's the alphabet and he can only sound or understand words when he hears them in its individual speech sounds. So we need to say, I, r, o, b, a, t, for him to understand. And so they, they can do this and then he can say some words and you can say them. So if uh, the robot or alphabet said, a, t, what is he saying? Right? These are, these are just activities that you can do that, you know, they're fun. Yes, they're explicit, but you know, we need a little bit of fun in our day, especially with these younger kids. And you can say, especially when we're talking about names. Oh, so the first sound in your name is B, Ben. What letter represents the sound B? And notice I'm saying represents, not says. Letters don't say anything. They represent sounds and they can represent more than one sound. And that's just a technicality that some people are pretty <laughs> finicky about. Um, but it's shifting our focus. And when we're teaching those sounds, we need to retrain ourselves from over enunciating the sound. Um, so instead of B, B says B for ball. No, B says B. You want to have that stop to it, you know, adding that extra vowel. Yeah, that's a really good point. I've heard a lot of um, uh, language pathologists point that out. Yeah. Um, all right. So I think that kind of does an adequate job of covering kindergarten to some extent. What about grade one, grade two? What do we want the kids to, to be learning during this time period? 
Well, first, I mean, I'm gonna say it for every grade period is the screening, right? You wanna establish a baseline. Yeah. When you're introducing the phonics instruction, you want it to be systematic and explicit. You want to be using decodable text. I know there is all sorts of great authentic texts out there that we want that to be the goal, but we want to set our students up for success to get them there. I see these leveled text in the classrooms all over the place. And Yes, the kids can appear that they're reading them, but in actual fact, are they? I, there's this great YouTube video from the States, I believe, where a, parents took, a parent took a Raz Kid book, the Reading A to Z book, and got their child to read it. And the child had no problem whatsoever reading the book when she saw the pictures. But as soon as the pictures were removed, they couldn't read the text. And then the parent took the words up, chopped them up, took them out of the sentence of the, and had them laid across the table. They had no idea. So we wow. get this false sense of reading. And if you're using these tools in your classroom, the, the levels text and you see the kids all up to a high level and it's because they're really good detectives, right? They can figure out the, the sentence starter and what's happening in the book based on the pictures. But as soon as they get to the higher grades, they can't do this. Um, and even when they move beyond, I mean, I know my textbooks that I've read, <laughs> I can't use picture cues, right? I need, I need to know. So when we start in those early grades, you wanna have that systematic explicit phonics instruction for reading but also tell, uh, tie our writing instruction into it. I see so many um, pro, like spelling programs come out that are beautifully laid out and whatever, but there's no direct tie to the phonics program that's being done in the classroom. And the students aren't being asked to read books that follow the same spelling patterns. So we need to make sure that there is a uh, a relationship between the phonics instruction for reading and the phonics instruction for spelling and give them plenty of opportunities to play and explore with these activities. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree that, you know, the assessment part is going to be really key. And then we really need to start focusing on more explicit and systematic instruction of, of phonics at this stage. I think you, there, you definitely have to have some explicit and systematic instruction of phonics in the, uh, the kindergarten age. I don't want people to think otherwise, but like, I would think grade one, grade two, like that's when we're like sitting down, but like today we have a lesson on yeah. these sounds. Um, and I would definitely want to cover more than one sound in a yeah. lesson personally. That's my personal preference. Um, and I don't know we can yours. talk about voiced and unvoiced sounds. We can talk about a split vowel pair or digraphs and trigraphs. Kids understand these words if we use them. And that's that vocabulary section where we wanna to speak to kids like they can understand what's going on. And it, it's very easy to oversimplify things when you don't really need to do it. As long as they have that explicit support and we're saying, okay, remember a digraph is two letters that represents one sound. Um, yeah. And taking the time to discuss things like plurals. So when we're writing and we're wanting to talk about more than one toy, we're saying toys. And so morphological awareness has to do with the um, spelling patterns or morphemes that have a meaning implication to them, right? So if it's a prefix, a root, a base, um, a suffix, these are all things that we can begin early and you can even have this morphological awareness instruction start in you know, the kindergarten stages where we're doing it as more as a vocabulary fun activity. I've done lessons where I bring in photos of a unicycle, a bicycle, and a tricycle. And I work on helping them understand that uni means one, bi means two, tri means three, and cycle means wheel. So we discuss yeah. this. And this kind of goes along the structured word inquiry approach to teaching 
things. But at this point, I'm not expecting them to understand that the C in cycle represents, represents both the S and the K sound. Some kids might be picking up on that, but that's not the point of the lesson. But I still include the, the letters and the, the spelling of those words. Um, just so that the audience knows, because I don't know that everyone in the audience will know, can you define for people what morphology is? Sorry. Uh, morphology is the, so a morpheme is a unit of um, speech that has meaning to it, meaning associated with it. So the English language is a morphophonemic language. Our spellings are based on both morphemic and phonological um, encoding, right? Now, morphemes, which are those prefixes, roots, suffixes, dictate spelling more so than phonemes. That's why we have those quote unquote irregular words and why we have things like PH representing the sound. It's because of morphology and English is a language that has been made up of many languages and a lot of our words, especially academic words and naming words come from Greek and Latin origin. Well, the Greek and Latin alphabet did not have the letter F. And so we use the PH to represent the F sound. And that's a trick that you can teach kids when you're talking about a science word and it has to do with the sound, it's gonna be PH. And I know, you know, my daughter recently had that in a spelling test for grade three. They were doing telephone, photography, right? Uh, paragraph, right? So these are words that they're seeing and that they should know. But if they understand that the pH is there because of the background, or sorry, the, the etymological or the, the history of the word, they have a better understanding of why. And then in that spelling test where there was paragraph and photograph, we can talk about how the base element graph means image or picture. Mm -hmm. And so that gives them a little bit of that vocabulary edge so that when they come across a larger word like uh, sonograph, I mean, not that a grade three would likely come across that, but then they can use that when they're older saying, oh, sonograph, well, that's having to do with a picture of something. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I think, thinking back to like what you started off here with on, on the, the topic of assessment, mm -hmm. um, like I would think hopefully by the end of kindergarten, yeah. students have phonemic awareness. Yeah. So they, they can identify the individual sounds in a word and they can segment a word apart. And they know or the base one or two syllable words. Yes, yeah, sorry. Not expecting this to be multi-syllable. You don't want to give them super califragilistic expialidocious and expect them to do it into their phonemes. I don't think I could do that very easily. Yeah, that's a fair point. And I would I would think we would want them to know their basic consonant sounds, not necessarily their vowel digraphs, but I would think we would want them to know like what does the B sound make. Yeah. Um, and I'm I'm thinking for grade two or grade one, sorry, ideally we would want them to be hopefully starting to teach them uh, more of the digraphs and the trigraphs and hopefully having them sort of fluent with those sounds by the end of grade two. But I'm, I'm, I think that's also, you gotta be realistic is dependent on the um, assessment data, as you pointed out. Because if we have grade two students who don't have phonemic awareness, we're probably gonna have to go back and teach that. And the other thing that I find is often missed from these screening assessments and a very, important one that's easy to do. You don't have to go out and buy a test kit for this. Sit the child down and ask them to print the alphabet for you A to Z. See how long that takes them because that's gonna be very, very telling to you. If they can do it, no problem, that's great. That's what you want. But if it's taking them a long time, that's pointing to a problem with automaticity. They don't have that automatic association between what the letter is and what it looks like yep. and how they form it. So that's going to give you so much information that you need to know. And also look at it. Is it all lowercase? 
Is it all capitals? Is it a mix? These are things that I, I see so many times with students that get referred to me that teachers don't necessarily, like, it's not often that in grade one or grade two, you're gonna ask the student to write A to Z and pick up on that. But when you're seeing their written assignments, you're seeing them use a mix of capital and lowercase letters, and you're not really sure why. Well, do they actually know what a capital D and a lowercase D looks like? Can they form them? Yeah. I, I agree with you completely. And uh, it's funny, I recently put out a free like phonics screener on my on my website. And the very first thing I put on the screener is uh, just the letters. Do they know their their alphabet? Because, um, and we've kind of glossed over that, I think, but I think it, you can't be, I don't think you should be starting to teach the, um, the letter sounds in like their letter representations if they don't know the letters themselves first. But again, I don't think it should, Ideally, it shouldn't take long to teach the students the alphabet. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's that's just, you can't assume that children are going to come to class knowing. No, yeah, I agree with you. We can't assume they know it, but it doesn't necessarily take us long. I, I think a, a good teacher should be able to teach the majority of their students the alphabet relatively quickly. And, you know, another thing is, so I think a couple of years ago, they came out with a new song for the alphabet. And the, the problem with this, and being a dyslexic who struggled with phonological awareness, I used to think elemental pay was one letter. Oh, really? I, yeah, I didn't realize that L, M, N, O, P was a whole bunch of different letters. Mm. Because it kind of blurred it through. And that's where we see the phonemes are not distinct in speech. Yeah. Right? And if you're a lazy speaker or are not good about your articulation. I mean, everybody has their moments, but you know, with dialects and hearing, you know, individuals who have English as an additional language and accents, you have to realize that the, the language that the, the child hears at home can be very different from school or academic language and what's considered the traditional pronunciation of the word. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think that's a really good point. Um, I'm, I'm having to constrain myself a little here because I think there's some interesting debates going on in this topic right now in the academic world. And I wanna like get into it with you, but at the same time, I wanna like ground this in like practical takeaway points for like everyday teachers right now. So I'm just not getting into any debates, but so, um, the the next my next question is so what does this look like a scientific approach to teaching reading what does that look like in the grades three to five grades three to five is when we're starting to transition from teaching to read to sorry learning to read to reading to learn and i think we too often forget the importance of advanced phonics instruction and having a better understanding of why English words are spelt the way they are. And as a teacher, you kind of have to commit to that lifelong learning and that continuous discovery of the things that you're teaching about. And one of those things is learning more about the logic behind English and understanding why we have certain spelling patterns. So you may all know that come has an E on the end, but you may not know why. Well, come has an E on the end because it's related to came. And the relationship is why the E is there. So that's looking at the etymology of the word. And the E is to signify the relationship and not making the O say comb, right? Uh, and, you know, understanding that in an English word, now, this is something that's really important to highlight, especially when we're teaching various spelling patterns, is that a lot of these have to do with English words, not words that have been adopted into the English language from another language in the past century, right? So words like chi. Not, sorry, not chi. Um, Q. 
QI, isn't that she? Oh, uh, you know what? Don't 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 quiz me on my advanced phonics or my <laughs> morphology knowledge. Uh, I'm much better at quoting the research on why you should teach this than actually um, teaching advanced phonics okay. and morphology. Well, I will give you an easier example. So the word have. Oh, has please don't example. please don't quiz me. This is too much <laughs> on the spot, Doctor <laughs> Catherine. No. So the word have is not have, mm. uh, but it has an e on the end because the letter v in English cannot be at the end of a syllable. It has to have that E on the end. So even though A, V, E is a split uh, letter pal or split vowel or whatever you want to call it, it is the E being combined with the, um, the V at the end. So it can be a legal English word, whereas gave, the E does make the A say its long name. So these are all tips and tricks that you can learn as you get a better understanding into English, the spelling of English and the etymology of English. And the more that you can do this, the more that it's gonna help your students understand why words are spelled that way. Uh, and not just because it is. Mm -hmm. Uh, and those little factoids are going to stick in their head. And another great one to explore, especially if you're a word nerd, is looking at the phones themes. Now, most people haven't heard of phones themes, and right. they aren't the same thing as a morpheme. So a morpheme has a meaning, right? So a prefix has its meaning. And if you see it in a word, it's 99% of the time going to have one of the meanings associated with it. A phone's theme is a consonant blend that is often associated with the meaning. So for example, SN at the beginning of a word often reserve, uh, means something to do with the nose. Snow, uh, sn snooze, <laughs> sorry. Snore, sneeze, sniff, snuffle, right? So they all have to do with that nose or GL relating to light, glow, glisten, glimmer. Mm. And again, these are things that not, are not an essential part of your reading curriculum, but they're fun factoids. Yeah. Now, when we get into those middle uh, or intermediate school grades, that's when you want to have that more explicit nature into the spelling patterns and the rules associated. Personally, not this isn't my resource, but I find the logic of English to be a very effective book for teachers to reference because you can read it in four or five hours, according to what is it, Kindle? Mm -hmm. And it explains it to you so you're not constantly saying, you know what, I don't know. It just is. I was I was actually just reviewing the logic of English on my my website. Uh, I gave it ten out of ten. Uh, yeah. I, I, it looks great to me. Yeah, and there's also uh, etymology online. So if the if you have a student in class that's asking you about the spelling of the word and you don't want to just say because it is, uh, look it up on etymology online and it will give you the origin of the word. And it will look at why it's spelled the way it is. And that's a free resource um, for you to reference. Now, so once we're in grades three to five and we're confident that the word recognition side of things is improving and along that correct trajectory, that's when we want to start doing the explicit teaching of the structure, the syntax and the semantics of the language so that students can get that deeper understanding of what they're reading, because we are expecting them to read to learn, and they are going to be ideally reading so much more. Now, if you do have a student who is on the lower end of reading or one with a specific learning disorder in reading, that's when you definitely want to start making sure they have the accommodations in place to help them in instances where reading is an afterthought to the task at hand. So for example, if you are doing a class novel study and the point is to learn 
learn about what's happening in the novel, make inferences and test the comprehension of what's being discussed, and give them an audiobook. Allow them to have the same access to the text as their peers. However, that does not mean that this accommodation replaces quality reading instruction. It is an assistance too. So the student should still be getting the support in the word recognition side of the equation at the same time, or sorry, well, at a different time uh, during the day because we still want them to become independent fluent readers. And again, you're gonna have to refer to your screening assessment to tell you where the appropriate instruction needs to occur. Yeah. Um, I, oh, I think, oh, sorry. One more, one more part about the audiobook. We should yeah. also be having them using audiobooks if you are using a silent reading practice in your classroom. If they cannot read the text fluently and they are struggling, you're not doing them any favors asking them to read books silently in class. It is better for them to listen to an audiobook because then they're going to be able to access text at their comprehension level and have the exposure to the vocabulary that their peers are getting. If you're stuck reading books in the grade one or two level, you're not going to have the same vocabulary exposure as your peers and it's going to impact the individual's vocabulary development. The number of words that a high achieving um, avid reader reads in a week in grade five is more than their peers who are poor readers are going to read throughout the entire grade. And having that exposure through the audiobook is going to make things a little bit more of a level playing field for them. Yeah, I, it's funny, I was actually just about to bring up silent reading. Um, I think this is the stage where it becomes really important personally, where we need to have that um, structured reading practice, where we need to have students practice reading, but they also need to have an adult who's available to help them with unfamiliar words. And the problem, and this is, I think, the big problem with Fontes Canal is there's such a focus and emphasis in that balanced literacy school of thought on silent reading but you don't necessarily have that encouragement of an adult there to help them with those unfamiliar words. I remember being in school and being told, well, if you don't know the word, grab a dictionary. You know what? I never once grabbed a dictionary. Um, well, if you can't read the dictionary, it's not gonna help you either. Yeah, well, for me, I was just like, that's way too boring. I'm gonna skip it. But, uh, and, and it, I think there's a lot of different options. Like you can do read alouds. And I think every class should have read alouds always, but especially in that grade three to five age group personally. And uh, uh, you know, reading repeated reading is one that gets gets criticized sometimes for possibly good reason, but it's very well evidenced within the meta-analysis literature. The Iowa Reading Council put out very reading. I don't think it really matters specifically which one you're doing, but I think it matters that your kids are getting, your students are getting um, a lot of time practicing reading once they have those decoding skills in place or those basic decoding skills in place, where there's also uh, an adult who can help them with those unfamiliar words. Um, and model words for them. Exactly. And I still think it's very important at this stage and even in high school to have a time where you as a teacher are reading a text at a higher reading level to the students. I mean, there may be some kids in your class that can read at that level, but if you're teaching a grade three class, read a text that the, the text is at a grade five level. So you can model those comprehension strategies and ways of approaching the text say you know when i'm doing this i think about this now let's before we start let's try and remember what happened last time we read just to you know give those strategies and even you know one of the strategies i like using with my with my students is creating, you're using graphic organizers to map out the story and map out the characters in the novel. So do that, have someone, you know, do it on the whiteboard and then get, have a dedicated artist for the day to draw what we've learned about the main character, right? And work on those visual note-taking strategies. So it's not all handwritten words, which of course we want to emphasize or emphasize, 
but realize that sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. So if we're talking about the main character and we learned that, you know, they had brown hair and blue eyes, then draw a picture. Mm -hmm. uh, just draw a simple oval <laughs> with blue eyes and brown hair, right? Yeah. It just gives them a, a quick reference. Yeah. And, and to sort of try and summarize this section of the, the video slash podcast, because I think I'm going to put this up on both the podcast and YouTube. Um, I think grades three to five, we're starting to transition away from phonics, but in the, un, in the un understanding that we've assessed and we know they actually do know their phonics, they do have their phonemic awareness. And that's always the golden caveat. You have to do assessment. You have to know what your students already know, and you have to teach to what they need to know. Um, and then we're looking at things like morphology, as you point out, advanced phonics, um, and uh, sort of fluency um, interventions or reading practice, which I would just call, you know, structured reading practice, where there's an adult practicing reading with the student. And I would imagine more comprehension. We're starting to introduce more comprehension um, into the into the fray. Would you agree with that that summary? Yes, definitely. And um, making sure that you do have that explicit nature to some of these skills, and make sure that. If you have a student that's missing a day of school, you go back and fill it in. Yes, it's a little bit of extra work on your part, but it means that they're not having a hole in yeah. their knowledge and you can build on it further instead of say they missed two days in October. Uh, and then, you know, you're really seeing problems in December because you didn't go back and make sure they had that core knowledge. I mean, we see this a lot more in like mathematics instruction, but it's just as important in reading instruction. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think math and language are more related than people think they are, although that's a whole side tangent conversation. Um, okay. So grade six, grade seven, eight, that's where I do most of my teaching. And I think that's where screening becomes really important, especially in some senses, because if you have a student who can't read, you've really got to go backwards and figure out what's missing. Um, but what do we think the, the core of instruction should be at grade six, seven, eight for reading? Well, let's go back to those ones that are missing. So okay. grade five, six, seven, eight is when the students are stopping being able to mask their, um, their troubles because the demand is just that much higher, right? So they still can't use those clues from the pictures, right? There's more um, text that's dense and we're expecting them to learn how to do these things. Now, when we're looking at reading instruction on these levels, we wanna make sure that we give them explicit instruction and practice answering the different question types related to comprehension, right? Understanding the shape of a story, understanding how things are put together in text and looking at the different types of texts that they're going to be reading. Are they reading fiction? Are they reading nonfiction? Are they reading graphic novels? How do we have to be a critical consumer of what we are reading? Um, looking at strategies for going through textbooks. There is a lot of money, time, and effort put into textbooks, but I find a lot of teachers don't use them the way that they're designed to be used. So you're not talking about all these, you know, ways that you can read a textbook effectively. Like it's SQ3R, scan. Okay, I can't remember what those stand for, I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> scan, question, read, review, respond, I think it is. Mm. But it's teaching them strategies. Like first, if you're reading a textbook, scan it. And then look at the questions at the back of the book, right? Scan the headings and the subheadings. Oh, sorry, look at the, back, the questions at the back of the chapter. Think about the questions that you want to ask yourself or that you're hoping to learn from that initial scan. And then be active in your reading. And as you're reading and going through, jot down notes. That's another skill that we definitely need to explicitly teach in these grade five, six, seven, eight years as making sure that they learn how to note take. 
and don't just read a sentence, make a note from it. Realize that it's more important to read the whole paragraph or even this whole section before you take a note because with a paragraph, you tell them what you're gonna tell them, then you tell them, and then you tell them what I told you. Um, so let's uh, make sure that we have explicit time for instruction on how to read these texts and the different types of texts that we are reading. Show them how to dig deeper in those fiction texts, right? Teach them about perspective taking and try those different strategies. Um, and again, having those sessions where you're reading aloud a text at a higher reading level and modeling those skills, teaching them how to answer questions based on the question itself. These are all things that yes, some students figure out on their own, yeah. but a lot need that explicit instruction and you save so much frustration for the students if you just say, look, this is how you do it instead of figure it out for yourself, yeah. right? I mean, discovery-based learning and inquiry-based learning has its place. I agree. But where we need to realize is it's not best practices for all students. And we need to try and make sure that our instruction is reading as many students as a classroom as it we possibly can so that tier one really is 70% of the classroom, right? Tier two is another 25%. And then it's only 10 or 15 that are getting that tier one. There has been several studies showing that we can have only 5% of our student body that need that extended intensive intervention. And we need to try better and strive to do better as educators across the grade to make sure that our students are getting the instruction that they need in order to succeed the first time. Yeah, I 100% I, I agree with like everything you just said there. I feel like this grade six, seven, eight time span is really when we're, we need to start focusing. And in an ideal world where they all have are at the right grade level, but this is where we need to start focusing really on comprehension strategies, on writing strategies, on some deeper level thinking, on content knowledge, like, you know, reading a lot of nonfiction texts and really applying some of these skills, starting to ask them questions like, what is the theme? What is the potential bias? What is the perspective of the author? And that doesn't mean like start at grade six, we're like, here's a old man in the sea, tell me what the theme of the novel is. Um, but it, it, it's, it's when we start to build those that foundation to helping a grade 10 or a grade 11, 12 student do that task. Um, and, and hopefully getting some of these students ready, ready for higher learning if they so choose to go on that path. But it helps them become a better informed citizen if they know how to question. 100%. Right. And we definitely need that in this society that's so fixated on social media. And okay, so this is what they're posting on TikTok or whatever the latest craze is, but is it what it actually is? Mm -hmm. How many times did they have to take that video or the picture and make sure that the lighting was right and how much editing did they do to make sure it's exactly how they want you to see it, right? It's teaching them to be that critical consumer that's important for everyone, not just those headed for higher learning. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. And I think um, this is where like inquiry-based learning can be a little more useful and mm -hmm. where uh, we can do a lot more interdisciplinary study um, in language class in an ideal world at least. Um, and it's funny, I'm a, grade, I'm a grade eight teacher and I spend a lot of my, my free time writing about the importance of phonics and foundational, or foundational knowledge and um, explicit instruction. And yet I go to school and I teach um, very little of these things because I'm a grade eight teacher. Um, but again, this also is really dependent, I think, on the students in your class. If you have a student who can't read, you need to go back likely and teach them some foundational knowledge that they miss somewhere along the line for whatever reason, whether it's they have a, a learning disorder or they come from a low socioeconomic background or they just didn't receive the right instruction at the right time. Yeah, and then, you know, bring in the eat, shoots and leaves. 
we've got the colored, you know, the children's book with the pictures and get them to write the same passage, change up the punctuation and see how they can make it, you know, that much different with just change of the expression. I know another uh, great way or thing that we talk about in some of the reading comprehension is a prosody, right? And the expression in text. A great lesson that I did once was my brother's a broadcaster and on the radio and I got him to come in and talk to my class about expression and changing the tone of your voice and the volume. And, you know, it's one thing coming from the everyday teacher, but get one of the radio personalities, like some of them, especially if you're in a smaller town, all of them are jumping at the opportunity to do something like that because it brightens their day. Yeah. Um, I love that. That's awesome. That's an awesome lesson plan, by the way. Get an actor to come in. Yeah. No, that's, that's great. Um, okay. So if, if you don't mind, Dr. Catherine Garforth, I'm going to put you on the spot here. And I don't know why I just used your full name. I feel like I, I such a school teacher move to use someone's full name. Would you mind summarizing what you think should be the core instructional element for each uh, grade grouping that we went over? Okay. So junior KK is phonological awareness and basic phonics. We're working on those um, alphabetic skills, learning their letter sound uh, associations, letter formation, and tying it together while keeping it fun. You know, we're talking about ways that we can understand things and get information out, but that's not the focus of our literacy lessons. That's the focus of our other lessons. The one and two, we are focusing on making sure the phonics is down pat that they understand and are aware of the 44 speech sounds in the English language, but not necessarily all 200 plus graphemes that are associated with them, just the most common ones, but understanding traditional English spelling patterns and how to use them. We'll start introducing that morphology. I mean, just thinking about it, think of the suffix ing, ed, making words plural, those need to be explicitly taught. We can't leave those to chance. Uh, and that starts coming into the grammar that we begin to start seeing uh, and learning about nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs. In the grades three, four, five, this is where we're making the transition from learning to read to reading to learn. And this is where we need to make sure that we've screened the students are positive that they have the foundational skills that they need to transition to this phase of learning and then begin that introductory instruction into taking notes and what you need to do to be a critical consumer of texts. Grade six and seven and eight are working more on the morphological awareness, which should have been in the last grade section two, uh, the morphological awareness and learning how to be that critical consumer of literacy, looking at comprehension strategies, summary strategies, how to write uh, this information in a grammatically correct manner, and looking how to pull apart the text that we're reading. Is that about sum it up? No, I 100% I agree with everything you just said. So. Um, Thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Dr. Catherine Garforth. I, there I did it again. I don't know why I'm saying that. Uh, Dr. Gar, I got to pick one, Dr. Garforth or Dr. Catherine. Um, and uh, yeah, sorry, I'm getting uh, all fumbly with my words here again. You never know that I've recorded over 100 of these podcasts. Uh, that's it for now, folks. And until next time.